I am Brother Stephen Elabo, welcoming you to the Life Bible Church, Charlottesville, United States, a place where the undiluted Word of God is being preached. You are about to listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, as a comfort to share the mind of God with you and your family. I want you to be ready to pick up your pen and your paper and jot down important messages as they will do you good. God bless you and remain blessed. I chapter 1. But this is something we have probably uh, not done before because it's a new year, it's a new approach, it's a new life, and everything is turning around in your life in Jesus' name. I'm going to look at Malachi chapter 1 today. We're going to try and cover the whole chapter. And this chapter talks about a God demanding something from the people of God because he wants to do something special for us. He calls us into a special relationship. And as we look at Malachi chapter 1, I'm talking about giving God our best for his best. Giving God our best for his best. If we're going to have the best from God, he requires too that we will reciprocate. That he is, will do what we expect him to do. He loves us. He wants us to love him. He wants to bless us. He wants us to be a blessing unto his holy name as well. He wants to give the best to us. And he wants us to give our very best. Giving God our best for his best. As I told you, we're looking at Malachi. Look at Malachi chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 1. It says, the body of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Stop there for a moment. As you look at Malachi, you know, it's the last book of the Old Testament. And our message today is coming from the first chapter of the last of the last term um, of the last book. And as you look at this book, I'm choosing this book because uh, there's something here. Number one, it's a covenant book. It's a covenant book. And at this day of our covenant month, it's good to go to this book and see how can you have the best in this covenant month? How can you have the best in this covenant year? How can you have the best at this beginning of the rest of your life? It is a covenant book. Look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. It says, my covenant was with him of life and peace. My covenant was with him of life and peace. I want you to look at verse uh, chapter one, chapter 3 and verse uh, 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. I said, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So, as you look at this book, it's a covenant book. Not only that, number two, it is a connecting book. As you look at Malachi, it's looking to the past, and then it's looking to the future, and it's standing like he holds the past, and then he looks at the future because it's a connecting book. And this year, this is a connecting month for you. You will connect with God. You will connect with power. You'll connect with his provision. That's why we're coming to this. One, a covenant book. And two, a connecting book. Look at chapter 4. I mean in verses 5 and 6. It says, Behold, I will send unto you Elijah the prophet before the coming and of the great day and the dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers unto the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I smite, let I come and smite the earth, the world, with a cause. He's looking forward. But look at verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. As it looks to the past, it looks to the future. And it says, it is a connecting book. And that's why we're looking at this, because this year, there'll be a connection in your life. Amen. Connection with God. Connection with power. Connection with the promises of God. And connection with all the goodness of God in your life. In Jesus' name. A covenant book. A connecting book. It's a consoling book. All the sorrows of the past will go away. 
all the poverty of the past will go away. There's consolation this year. There is comfort this year. Look at the middle part of chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 10. It says, prove me now. Here we, it says the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven and then pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It's telling us that this year, consolation has come. It will wipe your tears away and it will take all your sorrows and all the need of your life. Solution has come in Jesus' name. Well, a covenant book and then a connection book and then a consoling book. And let's look at them one by one now. In chapter 1, chapter 1 talks about the burden of entreaty. The burden of entreaty. Here the prophet has a body. He says, Israel is loved by God. It's a special people unto God. You are a peculiar believer, a peculiar child of God. You are like no other child. God has given you a peculiar place in the kingdom. And I pray that that peculiarity, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. And as Malachi saw the people of God, he saw that the peculiarity was kind of a fading away. They were just like all the other nations, and they were asking themselves, where's our privilege? Where's our peculiarity? Where's our uniqueness? That's why chapter 1 is dealing with the burden of entreaty. Look at chapter 1 verse 1. It says the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And then chapter 2 is talking about the behavior in, its, uh, in view of eternity. Uh, the Malachi says you're wondering about your peculiarity. That's why I have a burden for you. You're wondering about your uniqueness. That's why I'm having a burden for you. It says... Can you think about your behavior in view of eternity? Look at chapter 2, verse 6. In chapter 2, verse 6, it says the law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. And then he goes on to say, and uh, did turn many away from iniquity. He said, that's what I appreciated in you, Israel. That's what I appreciated in you, the people of God, the behavior in view of eternity. He said, the burden I'm having now for the children of Israel is that they were kind of slowly going away from that center and from that behavior in view of eternity. Then it comes to so chapter 3. He said, we can reconnect again. We can plug in again and we can come into the blessing in its entirety. Blessing in its entirety. It says, it's not lost yet. Something new is coming. Are you there? It said something new is coming. Look at chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading here from the middle of verse 10. It says, put me now here we, says the Lord. Of course, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, an outpouring is coming. Somebody there said, an outpouring is coming. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. Turn that you into me, and all nations shall call me blessed. Say that again, and all nations shall call me blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. Chapter 1 is talking about the burden of entreaty. Chapter 2 is talking about the behavior in view of eternity. Chapter 3 is talking about the blessing in its entirety. And then chapter 4 is talking about the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. I want you to look at chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And it shall turn the heart of the fathers unto the children, and the heart of the children unto the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a cause. Something new is going to begin. A new provision, and a new promotion, and a new power is going to come in your life in Jesus' name. As we look at this, talking about giving our best, giving our very best for 
is best. The Lord wants us to have the best, but before then, he wants you to also understand. You must be born again. You are born again. You come to the Lord and you are a child of God. All the past is gone. Now you face a new direction. You face a new destiny. Sin is confessed and sin is forsaken. And then you become a real child of God. What did you give to the Lord at that time? For him to give you the very best salvation. You give your heart. You give your life. You give your mind. You say, Jesus, I give my heart to you. Jesus, I give my heart to you. Jesus, I give my future to you. Jesus, I give my destiny to you. And because you give your heart to the Lord, then he understood, he gave Jesus Christ for you on the cross of Calvary. He gave Jesus Christ for you to be your Savior and your Lord. And it is sealed in Jesus' name. Well, don't stop there. If you're going to keep on getting the best from the Lord, you say, Lord, I lay my everything on the altar again. I consecrate myself. I surrender myself. My heart, my life, everything I've got, I lay it on the altar. It is that absolute surrender all to Jesus. I surrender all to him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. And in his will, I will always obey. I surrender all. I surrender all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. That's why you were sanctified. He sanctified you. He purified you. He poured you. And then your soul became totally different. Something new happened again. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. He said, don't go away yet. There is a power. Power is coming upon your life. Somebody there said, power is coming upon your life. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. And it says, tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. There are many people that go through life. They say, I'm born again. They say, I'm saved. They say, I'm sanctified. Holy Ghost power, supernatural power, the dynamite of the of heaven coming upon your soul. That dynamite will come upon your soul. If you have been saved so many years and been sanctified so many years and only holiness, holiness, but no power, this year you'll have the power of God. I said you'll have the power of God. And then it says, you tarry in Jerusalem. It says, for ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. You'll have it in Jesus' name. And after you've had those great Christian experiences, you don't stop there. You keep on in your family devotion, your personal devotion, in learning the word of God and living by the word of God. You keep on giving your very best best unto God. And as you give your very best unto God, the best will keep on coming to you every time in Jesus' name. And so you make it a response to the Lord, a responsibility to the Lord that you're always giving and he is always giving. You're always giving and he is always giving. And that's how you're going to spend this year and what a wonderful year is going to be for you in Jesus' name. Giving God our best for is best. We're looking at three points. Number one, the confirmation of passionate compassion for the sons of God. The confirmation of passionate compassion for the sons of God. Number two, we're looking at the condemnation of polluted, contemptible sacrifices for God. The condemnation of polluted, contemptible sacrifices for God. The children of Israel at this time, they were offering things to God that were not acceptable to God. It was polluted and it was contemptible. And God said he wasn't going to receive that from them. And that is why temporarily they were not receiving the very best from God. Number three now is consecration of pure, commendable service to God. He wants us to come back again. You are coming back again. Somebody there, I can't hear you. I say you are coming back again. And you come back to giving everything you've got, your very best unto God. Come back to number one. What's number one? Tell me there. Confirmation of passionate compassion for the sons of God. We're looking at Malachi chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, The body of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, Wherein have I, have I loved you? As have, have you loved us? It says, Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Says the Lord. Yet I loved Jacob. That's the confirmation of love for Jacob. 
the confirmation of love for Jacob. The confirmation of love for Jacob. He wants to confirm to you how much he loves you. He wants to confirm to you. And he says, look at the things I'm doing in your life. And look at from the moment before you were saved to the moment you were saved. And to the moment you have been following the Lord until this time. The confirmation of love for Jacob. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. It says, and I hated Esau. Watch. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage ways for the dragons of the of the wilderness. And what the Lord means here is that he had less love, limited love for Esau. Yeah, I'll explain that to you later. You see, the love God had for Esau almost looked like what are you doing to me? What are you doing for me? It looks like something limited. And because of that, it's like hatred. And you remember Jacob himself, he had, uh, you know, those two women in uh, his life. And the way he appeared and the way he loved Rebecca and the love she had for Leah was like, uh, you know, it's like you hate me. Because that's comparison. It's like when Jesus Christ said, if you're going to follow me, you will love me more than and your father and your mother and then he uses the word hatred for that it's not hatred of bitterness it's not the hatred of antagonism it's not the hatred of punishment it's the hatred of comparison that is you love jacob so much and the love you have for me is like uh, you know it's like hatred it says in verse 4 whereas edom says we are impoverished but we will return and build the desolate places says the lord of course, then he says, they shall build, but I will throw down. That's the meaning of the hatred there. He says, I'm going to judge them because they are not giving themselves to me and they're running away from me. Therefore, I'm going to judge them and they shall call and they shall be called the border of wickedness. The people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. That is consideration of less love for Israel. The consideration of less love for Esau. And then verse 5 tells us, and your eyes shall see. Your eyes will see something. I said your eyes will see something. You will see blessing this year. You see the glory of God this year. It says your eyes shall see. And you shall say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Look at that section that we're referring to as a confirmation of passionate compassion for the sons of God. How do you become a child of God? You leave the things of the world. You leave your sins, all the sins you had before, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then you say, I come to the Lord. I look at Calvary. I look at what he has done for me. I accept, I believe, I receive, I trust. And because I trust in Jesus Christ who died for me, then you become a child of God. As many as receive him, to them, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. And the Lord has shown you that as you trust him like that, like, like Jacob trusted him, like Jacob believed in him, he was a supplanter before, he was a sinner before. But now he came to the Lord, he said, Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe, I believe you, I trust you. And this place where I've rested today, I didn't know it's the gate of heaven. Your salvation, that's the gate of heaven. Your conversion, that's the gate of heaven. The moment you trusted the Lord, that's the gate of heaven. And since that time, the Lord had mission compassion, compassion and love to Jacob. And since the time of that, of that new birth and that salvation, see the great uh, compassion the Lord has had for you. But remember, it says that uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading here from verse 17. You see what we need to do and how we become the sons of God and the daughters of God and the children of God. It tells us very clearly here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. It says, wherefore, come out from among them. It's your repentance. It's your turning away from sin. It's your turning away from evil. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. You don't want to be remain like Esau. 
that soul is battered, become separate. You don't want to become like Lord, like went to Sodom and Gomorrah. It says that you will separate yourself unto him. Turn away from sin and turn to the Lord and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And when you become sons of God like that, he says, Jacob, have I loved. Jacob, have I loved. That is, because you turn to the Lord, he loves you. He loved you before you responded to that love. And now he continues to love you. Uh, we're looking at uh, Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 7. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, here he tells us about this special love about this unique love and the responsibility that comes upon you as a child of God because you love the Lord. Jacob, have I loved, and you have I loved. I'm reading from verse 3 here, neither shall thou make marriages for them. That thy daughters shall thou not give unto a son, and his daughter shall not thou not take to thy son. Now that you are born again, you are special. And he loves you. But that love carries responsibility. He says you will not marry the people of the world. You will not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For they will turn away thy son from following me. That they may serve all the gods. And so will, uh, will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. And destroy you suddenly. He is saying that uh, unequal yoke will bring sudden destruction. It will stop the flow of the blessing of God upon your life. It will actually bring his judgment. It says, but, uh, but it says, it does. Shall ye deal with them? Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and turn their graves and burn their, their graving images. A fire. It's just saying that you have nothing to deal with occultism. You have nothing to deal with idolatry. You have nothing to deal with the powers of darkness. Now you are born again. Therefore, you totally reject everything that is of the world, that is of darkness. And for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people a peculiar people, a unique people, a blessed people unto him above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Then it says, the Lord did not set his love upon you and choose you because ye were more in number than any people for ye were the fewest of all people. But because God loved you, he loved you. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the Bible has told us the truth. Because the Lord loved you. And because he will keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. As the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. And redeemed you out of the house of bondage. From the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. He is a faithful God. He keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him. You see that? He loves you, now you love him. You reciprocate. You see, because he has loved me, and because he has chosen me, and because he delights in me, and because he has given me a salvation, I will love him too and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So we have the confirmation of love for Jacob. And that love, I pray, this year, you see the practical demonstration of that in your life in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. If you are part of the church, I don't mean the visible church, I mean the invisible church. If you are part of the church, the ecclesia, they called out people, the people who have come out of the world and they have come to the Lord and you become part of the bride of Christ. He loves you because he loves the church and because he loves the bride. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it to the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. You see the goal of Christ for the church? 
the purpose of love for the church. And if you're a Christian, you're born again, you're a child of God, you're saved and you're sanctified, see the goal and see the purpose and say the reason why you come into the body of Christ that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or equal or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It will happen in your life. And then we see now the consideration of less love for Esau. Less love for Esau. And that's why it says, and Esau, I hated. I've told you already, it's a watch of comparison. When you compare the, the love of a God for uh, Jacob, and you compare that with the love of God for Esau, Esau will be thinking, it's like hatred. It's like he has less love for me. God loves everyone. He loves everyone. But he loves the church more than he loves the world. He loves the people of the world. He gave Jesus Christ for everyone in the world. So that whosoever will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll come into that special love. If you are born again, that's how you came into that special love. If you are not born again, you're seen in the world. He loved you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 that she may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his a son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. There are things he gives to the sinners. There are things he gives to the unjust. But then when it comes to the just and the believers and the children of God, he now gives special blessings unto them. That the people of the world will just look like, oh, he, he has not shown us enough love. There's limited love for them. Like there was limited love for the people of uh, the world and also for Esau. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's relate this with Jacob and Esau. You see, yes, Esau sinned. Yes, Esau took uh, that birthright. Yes, Esau supplanted, sorry, I mean uh, Jacob supplanted Esau. But then he sought forgiveness. He even tried to make restitution. And he said, uh, go and give this to Esau. And uh, she pleaded with him. Esau said, no, I have enough. He was still not seeing the hatred. It is sad. But Jacob, Jacob did not know any hatred. He said, yes, I did wrong. And because I did wrong, I'm going to repent. He repented. And then you remember the wrestling of Jacob with that personality from heaven. That is with the angel of God. And then he said, let me go. And Jacob said, I will not let you go. You accept to bless me. He received the blessing. He was saved. He received the blessing. He received the love of God. And so God said, because you have sought my face, I love you. And I'm going to show special love for you. How about Esau? Uh-uh. Esau retained the hatred. Esau retained the animosity. The days of the death of my father is at hand. And then I will kill Jacob. And then Jacob ran away. And when he came back, about 20 years later, he said, go give this to my brother. And he said, go and tell him I'm coming with 400 people. I'm going to deal with you. That man did not follow peace with anybody. You saw? That man did not follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's why it says in verse 15, looking diligently, lest any root of bitterness, lest, uh, lest anyone fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up, uh, says uh, uh, they trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. In the case of Esau, root of bitterness was there. That's why he couldn't experience the fullness of the love of God and the fullness of the provision of the Lord. It says in verse 16, lest there be a, any fornicator and profane person. Profane person means, uh, you know, a defiled person, a worthless person, a person that doesn't have any, any purpose and any position in the sight of God. I pray you will not be like that. 
a person that God was thinking about and said, that man, no repentance, that man, no restitution, that man, no righteousness, that man, just a useless, worthless man. Let anyone be a prophet, a prophetic person, as Esau, who for one morsel of bread sold his birthright. For ye know how that actual when he would have uh, inherited the blessing, he was, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He really couldn't bring himself into repentance and couldn't really seek the face of the Lord and have everything he ought to have. That's why God had limited love for him. And then he was always seeking to hate Jacob, persecute Jacob, revenge on Jacob. Let me show you. In Obadiah, I'm reading chapter 1. It has only one chapter, actually. Obadiah, look at this. In this uh, one chapter, Obadiah, look at verse 6. Obadiah, look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? That is, his hidden sick, uh, hatred, his hidden animosity, his hidden bitterness against his brother Jacob. It says in verse 10, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and, for, and thou shalt be cut off forever. That's the reason why no repentance. That's the reason why only bitterness, only anger, he was manifesting all the time. And Jacob was trying to make the move. Let's settle this sin. Let's forget about this thing. Yes, I did wrong, but I'm giving you all this now. All the 20 years I went away, look, I'm giving you back. They said, don't worry. I have enough, but I'm still going to take the pouch of flesh. I'm still going to take, I'm still going to revenge. That's why God said, Jacob I love and Esau I hate. And then number three now is the commendation of the limitlessness of God. The commendation of the limitlessness of God. How God without limit wants to pour his blessing out. Come to Malachi chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. And it says, your eyes shall see. The goodness of the Lord, your eyes shall see. And the fruit of the gospel, your eyes shall see. And the benefits of the kingdom, your eyes shall see. And the answers to your prayers, your eyes shall see. And, and the joy of serving the Lord this year, your eyes shall see. Our God is unlimited. Our God is limitless. And he will do great things in our lives this year. In Jesus' name, turn to the right, you will see the blessing. Turn to the left, you'll see the blessing. And move forward, you'll see the blessing. All around you are coming from on high. The blessings of God will be upon your life in Jesus' name. Your eyes shall see. And we and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. And I pray that this year will be a year of seeing that blessing upon our lives in Jesus' name. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 11. We're looking at verse 7. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 7, here is what it says. It says, And your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. And you'll continue to see. Then in verse 21, in verse 21, it says that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them. Look at this, as the days of heaven upon the earth. The days of heaven upon the earth. Those days are coming. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. If you accept, you'll see the fulfillment of the promise. In Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. What do you mean from verse 23? Luke chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 23. And see the joy of the Lord. The rejoicing of the Lord. Because of what the Lord was going to do. And what the Lord was doing already for his own people. Luke chapter 10 and verse 23. It tells us... and. And, and he said, and he turned, and he turned him unto his disciples, and privately said, Blessed are your eyes which see the things that ye see. 
And for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. He's saying that this year, all that your eyes will see of the goodness of God, you'll be so surprised. You see, I didn't know the Christian life is as wonderful as this. Yes, it's more wonderful than you can ever tell. Because of the limitlessness of our God. Verse 19, before we pass on, before we move on, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means make a personal hurt me. We're coming to point number two now. The condemnation of polluted, contemptible sacrifices for God. The controversy that the Lord had with the children of Israel. And uh, the controversy that the Lord has with quite a number of so-called believers. I pray that if God has this controversy with you, you resolve it completely so that this year will open up a new page for you in Jesus' name. Malachi chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. His son honoreth his father, and his servant his master. If I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despise thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. You see those two words there? On the one hand, the word polluted. That's verse 7, wherein have we polluted thee? And on the other hand, the word contemptible, polluted and contemptible. It says in verse 8, and if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Uh, or accept thy person, says the Lord of hosts. And look up here, what was happening here, he says, he took the love of God for granted. God lost me, God lost me, this I know. God lost me, and he is a faithful God. He will keep on loving me. Whatever I do, whatever I don't do, he keeps on loving me. And God said, you're misinterpreting this law. You're misconstruing this law. He says, you're misplacing this law. You're taking me for granted. And then the priests were there and they were offering polluted sacrifice unto the Lord. And the Lord is saying, what is all this? How can you offer something like this? They said, but you love us. And where is the love? You say you love us. Allow us. Give us permission to sin. Give us permission to offer polluted things. Don't you? Give us permission to offer contemptible things. To you. After all, you love us. You love us. You love us. And God said, now, his son will honor the father. The father should love the son, but the son should also show affection to the father. And a, a master will love the subject or the, you know, the, the servant, but the servant must also reciprocate. And then he says the governor must love the subject, and the subject too must show loyalty and obedience and responsibility in the as citizens of the community. And so he said, but if I am father, where is my honor? If I am master, where is my honor? If I am governor, where is my honor? I said, okay now, the children of Israel, the people of Judah, and those who belong to Jacob, Israel, offer this to your governor. Will they accept that for, from you? That's what the Lord was saying. He condemned, polluted, contemptible, corrupted uh, sacrifices for him. Number one, God is father. He wanted them to understand that. Number two, God is master. He wanted them to know that. Number three, God is governor. As a God is father, he wants affection because this is now a family and he wants relationship. That's a family. As God is master, he wants responsibility. That the, the servant to the master must show that I'm responsible. I have obligation. This is what I need to do as the subject to the governor. First, the son to the father. 
Second, the servant to the master. And third, the subject to the governor. There must be royalty because he is governor. And there must be responsibility because he is master. And there must be relationship because he is father. You know, some people think only the New Testament address God as father. But no, the people of Israel, those uh, people belonging to Jacob, they understood that God was their father. And that's what God was reiterating and repeating unto them. I am father, I am father, and therefore I demand honor. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we're reading here from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we're reading from verse 6 to show that God is father. And if there is father, there must be the affection between the son and the father. There must be the relationship that shows that this is father. It says in chapter 32, verse 6, Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? Is he not thy father that bought thee? And has he not made thee and established thee? Is he not thy father? Are you going to relate with him like this? Are you going to offer something like this to him that is polluted and corrupted and contemptible? Not only that, his master. Didn't Jesus Christ emphasize that fact to his own disciples when he said that he was he, and still is the Lord and master? In John chapter 13, John chapter 13, emphasizing the fact that God is master and Jesus Christ is our Lord and master. And if you say Jesus loves you, understand that he loves you to make you a child of God. There must be that good relationship and you must have that affection and love towards the Lord. And he loves you to make you his own servant. That he is master and he is Lord. Look at chapter 13, verse 13. He called me master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. For so I am. He is our master and God is our father. In Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're reading here from verse 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Not with eye service. As men please us. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. You know the demand of God. And you know how you need to respond to the love of God. Because he is master. Because he is Lord. Because he is Savior. Because he gave everything for you. said, it will not be with high service. He said in verse 7, with good will, doing, uh, doing service as to the Lord. And not unto men. It says you do this as to the Lord. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then you love God with all your heart. Love God with all your soul. Love God with all your mind. That you may live. It says in verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good seem. Any man doeth the same shall he receive of the Lord. Whether it be he be born or free. And ye masters do the same things. Unto them for bearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Knowing that your master also is in heaven. And then you come now to Malachi and he says, I am a father. Yes, he is. I am your master. Yes, he is. But then he also says, his governor. He says, can you offer that to your governor? Let's look at uh, God being the governor. He tells us in Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Talks about God. It talks about our Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at uh, this, uh, Psalm 22, if you start from verse 1, you begin to see uh, the prophecy concerning the cross. Concerning Calvary, concerning Christ's crucifixion, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words, the words of my roaring, of my groaning, and the words of my cry? And that tells you, that's the cross right there. Look at it, verse, look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, All day that see me love me to scorn, and they shoot out the leaf. A day they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that He will deliver him. Let him 
deliver him sin, he delighted in him. He's talking about a Christ on the cross of Calvary. When those uh, people were making jest of him, he says he saved others himself. He cannot save. Let now the king of the Jews come down from the cross and we will believe him. Look at verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleave it to, the jo to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. He says, for dogs, in verse 16, have come past me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hand, they pierce my feet. He's talking about Christ, but now come to verse 27. Verse 27 and verse 28, it says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the, tell me what's there, is the governor among the nations. Is the governor. Three things about our God, three things about our Lord. Number one, Father. Number two is master. Number three is governor. Come back now to Malachi chapter one. And the controversy that uh, the Lord had with the children of Israel is this. It says in verse six, chapter one, his son on earth is father, and his servant is master. And if I be a father, and he is, where is my honor? He said, how are you honoring me? I'm your father. And every time you pray, you have been taught to pray, a father which art in heaven. And then he says, for your heavenly father knows that he have need of these things. He says, it's your father. And because it's your father, what honor are you giving unto him? And then he says, if I be a master, where is my fear? If I be a master, where is the loyalty? Where is the responsibility? And where is the obligation? And where is the obedience you are granting unto me? He says, oh, O ye priests that despise my name, and you say, Wherein have we despised your name? It says, She offer polluted bread on, upon mine altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. Look at verse 8. And if ye offer the blind for the sacrifice, is it not evil? If ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer that now unto thy governor, will he be pleased with thee? Offer that to your governor, will he be pleased with thee? If I'm father, if I am master, if I am a governor, what are you offering to me? That's what he said. He was telling them that they were doing evil. Why? Because they were not giving the best to God. They expected God to give them his best. They expected God to give them great, great blessing. But on the other hand, they were not responding. They were not reciprocating. They were not reflecting that love of God. God has given us the best already. He's given us Jesus Christ. He's given us salvation. He's given us sanctification. He's given us the power of the Holy Ghost. He's given us promises. He's given us great, great things. He's even going to provide heaven for us. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He said, how are you then returning that favor back to God? In their own case, they were not offering the best. They were offering the worst. They were not offering the first. They were offering the leftovers. That is, they'll take care of themselves first. They'll provide for themselves first. They'll take the very best for themselves. And then the blind and the lame and the refuse and the useless, they'll offer that unto God. And God said, that's not acceptable. And he doesn't need to quote many verses of scripture to tell them it was not acceptable. He said, just simply offer that to your governor. Let's offer that to the government. Offer that to the people who are leaders over you in the world. Will they accept that? Why don't we think about the things we offer from the, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing? Is it the very best thing we offer unto the Lord our God? 
if you are, you know, for example, you are taking records and then you give that record uh, to the, in the house of God. Is that how you offer that? Let's say, for example, you're an accountant and then you have to do this and do that. Can you give that kind of record to the bank? Will the bank accept that? Or will they terminate your appointment? Or maybe let's say you're offering, uh, let's say worship before the Lord. You're singing unto the Lord. And the kind of singer, you see, can you uh, offer that in the concerts of the world? Can you offer that to all those ceremonies? Of the, that's what the Lord is saying. And let's say you're offering, for example, teaching. You want to teach the Bible and you're teaching the people of God and, uh, you know, you didn't prepare. Can you offer that in the schools in the world? Can you offer that in the college? Will they accept that in your hand? Let's say, for example, you're, offer, you're offering food in the house of God. And this is, you know, what you are serving the people of God. If you serve that in your canteen in the world, will you make any sales at all? That's what he's saying. He said, if you can not offer those things to the people of the world, to those who are fathers and masters and governors, how is it to think God will accept that from you? It's calling us to examine our service. It's calling us to examine our offering before the Lord. And he's saying that if the people of the world cannot get that from you, will not accept that from you, each year will not accept that from you. The best and not the worst. That's what we offer. The, the first and not the leftover. That's what we offer. The clean and not the unclean. Not the corrupt. That's what we offer. The pure and not the polluted. That's what we offer. The costly and not the cheap. That's what we offer. Uh, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and look at verse 21. And see the commandment the Lord has given. If you're offering anything to the Lord from the house fellowship uh, to the time, uh, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, district and then to the group and anything you're offering to the Lord, you must make sure you offer the very best. You go over that thing again, you polish that thing, you make it the very best you're offering unto the Lord. And then let's look at chapter 15, verse 21. It says, and if, that's Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 21, what we offer to the Lord. It says, and if there be any blemish daring, as, as uh, if it, uh, it, is, it was lame or blind or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. You see that? Anything you are offering to the Lord, if it has any blemish at all, you cannot offer it, you must not offer it unto the Lord. It tells us um, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, that's the controversy God had with Eli. The controversy he had with the sons of Eli. What they were offering to the Lord was not the very best. And people now, they detested the, the sacrifice of the Lord just because of them. Those things had no value anymore. And those things did not have any acceptance in the presence of the Lord anymore. It says in chapter 2, verse, 15, uh, chapter, verse 17, it says, Wherefore? The sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Men abhorred, despised, detested the offering of the Lord. It wasn't special anymore. It wasn't acceptable anymore. It wasn't the very first anymore. It wasn't the very best anymore. And God said he did not want that kind of sacrifice. He wanted the people to show some love, some respect, and some honor for him. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 22 and we're reading from verse uh, we're reading from verse 26 and those priests that were accepting that they were encouraging the people of Israel to offer just anything refuse something defiled something corrupt something polluted something contemptible unto the Lord. The priests were not, were not a kind of demanding the very best for God. They were not demanding the very first for God. And they were justifying those children of Israel that it was all right to offer polluted bread and polluted uh, corruptible and contemptible things. In Ezekiel chapter 22, verse, reading from verse 26, a praise about my law. 
and are profaned by holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the clean and the unclean. And have, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. It says, uh, my Sabbath, that is, uh, the holy day became like ordinary day. But everything became the same. And the offerings were, were polluted. And they were not acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Our princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. And it's to shed blood and to destroy the souls to destroy souls destroy the souls of men and that's why god now said he had no pleasure in all those sufferings and sacrifices they were making all that the lord was saying is i love you why don't you show some love back and i'm blessing you why don't you bless my name i want to magnify you like i magnified uh, Joshua, before the children of Israel, why don't you magnify me? And why don't you give to me the honor and the glory that is uh, due unto my name? Let's come back to Malachi. I'm reading here now from verse 10. Malachi chapter, chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. Who is there, even among you, that shall, or that will shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. Not. There must be a purpose. When you read any service before the Lord, you ask yourself, any purpose in that? Any glory in that? Any joy in that? Any sacrifice in that? Am I, I giving my best to the Lord? And the story is told of a particular man. He could swim. And then uh, something happened. There was a boat that capsized. And many people were in the water in the river. And it was storming. And this person will dive into the river. And then he saved the first person. And then he dived back again and saved the second person. He went on like that into the water, out of the water, into the water out of the water for about uh, for 17 times and then rescued 17 people and then himself he was laying on the ground on the floor at the shore exhausted they took him to the hospital because he was almost passing out himself and even after he had rescued those people his mind was still on the people that were perishing in the ocean and he was saying have i done my best over and over have i done my best have i done my best and that's what malachi is saying here malachi is saying have you offered your best have you given me your best have you done the best of what you're offering to the Lord? Is it the ordinary thing? You couldn't offer to your father in the world. And your father will say, I'm not a beggar. Take your gift away. Take that away. I don't want that. Or if it's a master in the world or a director in your place of work, you say, what, what report have you given? What, what is this that you have time for me? When did you get this? Take that away. I don't want to see that. Or if it's the governor of your state or the governor in your neighborhood that will say, I don't want on that and God said that's the kind of thing they were offering to me it's polluted and it's contemptible and I don't want that look at this now in the middle of verse in the middle of verse 10 it says I have no pleasure in you says the Lord of hosts neither will I accept an offering at your hand he said your life is polluted your purpose, you don't even have any purpose. The, the purpose, I can't discover the purpose of what you're giving to me. You dishonor my name. You dishonor my glory by the things you're offering to me. It says, I have no pleasure in you. Therefore, I will not accept an offering at your hand. Couldn't the Lord have said that to Achan? Achan, you have gone astray. Achan, you have taken their courses in. I have you are listening to our pastor. Pastor W. F. Kumoye, or other anointed minister of God from our ministry. Let the words sink in your heart and they will do you good throughout your whole life. It is our belief by the grace of the Lord that you will come and worship with us at Deeper Life Bible Church, Forty, number 4656 Bravo Drive. We have our service every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 11.30 and we have our Bible study on every Monday from 7 to 8.30. As you are doing so, and the grace of the Lord will continue to be with you and you will never be the same. Thank you. God bless you.